Will you open the Word of God this evening to the 29th chapter of Proverbs, where tonight we will find our text in verse 25. Here the word of the living and the true God reads, The fear of man bringeth a snare, but whoso putteth his trust in the Lord shall be safe. The word of God is our manual for this life. This is uh, something we, we discuss commonly here. The Word of God is, is something to be read devotionally, yes. But it is not something that is to be read and thought of, oh, that's a, that's a good idea, those are some great ideals, and set aside. It is, it is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. It is how we know where we are, and it is how we know where we are headed. It is how we can know anything in this life. It is this, uh, I believe it was Brother Jonathan, when, when uh, he was being examined here by the presbytery, he stated that it was our standard of which we can know truth. Yes. And that is absolutely true. It is the standard by which we can test anything. It itself even states so. That, that isn't a man's idea. That isn't man's concoction. Scripture is profitable, all of Scripture, not just some, not just the epistles, not just some, some of the New Testament, but all of Scripture, from Genesis to Revelation, is profitable. It's good. It has use. It is for us today. It is profitable for doctrine, that is, that is teaching. It is also profitable for reproof, for testing. You, you remember the Bereans search the scriptures daily to see whether those things were true. Right. What did they use? It wasn't, they didn't discuss with their friend. No, they searched the scriptures. Yes. They searched the scriptures to test what Paul was saying, to see whether those things were true. Correction. It is profitable for correction. It is profitable for correcting bad behavior. It is also profitable for instruction, instructing new behavior, that we may be complete that the man of God may be complete or perfect, as it is put in our King James, throughly furnished unto all good works. We have everything that we need in the Word of God. We do not need philosophies or methodologies or uh, any type of study of man. We have it here for us. This passage that we're examining tonight is no different. It is a very practical passage for us in this life. The fear of man, it brings a snare. And it is a terrible snare. Tonight, we'll, we will examine what, what all that entails. And should, uh, should the Lord provide time, we'll even get to the end of the verse. Fear. The fear of man. Let's start by defining terms. This word fear is only found nine times in the Old Testament. One thing I noted that I, that I believe is very important, it is never used in reference to God. Not one time. This type of fear is a trembling fear. A quaking fear is how it is also translated. Trembling, quaking, or care, a great anxious care. This, these are not godly things. These are, these are, this is not the kind of relationship we have with our Father. This is not the same kind of reverential fear we have of our God. This is, this is altogether different. I would like to examine a few passages that, that describe this very fear. And do remember, we have not been given a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Yes. We're told in uh, 2 Timothy 1 and verse 7, verse 7, come to the book of Numbers, where we'll see our first example. I learn, I learn best by example. This and, and the, the word of God is full of them. Romans 15.4 tells us whatsoever was written aforetime was written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Come to Numbers 13, where we'll see the first example that was written for our learning. We see in verses 1 and 2, here the word of God states, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Send thou men that they may search the land of Canaan which I give unto the children of Israel. For every, of every tribe of their fathers shall ye send a man, every one a ruler among them. The children of Israel 
are in the wilderness. They, they ha uh, have not begun their 40 years yet. This event is what would begin the 40 years. This is, this is where they are told that they will be in the wilderness for 40 years. But at this point, they did not know that that was going to be the case. They are told to send 12 spies into the land that was promised to their fathers. Spy it out. See, see, see if it is good. And then come back and then, and then decide to go. Was the intent? Was, was what was supposed to happen? But come down to verse 27. The 12 spies spent 40 days. They spent 40 days in the land that, that floweth with milk and honey. And they come back and give this report. And they told him and said, We came unto the land whither thou sent us, and surely it floweth with milk and honey, and that is the fruit of it. Nevertheless, the people be strong that dwell in the land, and the cities are walled and very great. And moreover, we saw the children of Anak there, the Amalekites dwell in the land of the south, and the Hittites, and the Jebusites, and the Amorites dwell in the mountains, and the Canaanites dwell by the sea, by the coast of Jordan. And Caleb stilled the people, for they're listening to all of this, and they're getting anxious. They're, they're concerned. There's a great people there. They've got great defenses. What are we going to do? Caleb stilled the people. Calm down. There's no need to be concerned. Call, stilled the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and possess it, for we are well able to overcome it. He knew that God was with them, and if they had done that, they would have taken it. Right. They would have taken it. We'll see, we'll see very shortly that he knew that that was going to be the case, but they, they, were not, they were not trusting the Lord. They were very concerned about these men. We continue reading. But the men that went up with him said, We be not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. When the Lord's with you, it doesn't matter how big and strong man, man is. You look at David and Goliath. David, David was but a boy. Goliath was a man of war from, from since he was a boy. And Goliath was a literal giant. Yes, there were literal giants in those days. Goliath was a, was a man of war and a giant nonetheless. David was a boy. When the Lord is with you, even a boy can take out giants. That's right. 32, and they brought up an evil report of the land which they had searched unto the children of Israel, saying, The land through which we have gone to search it is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof, and all the people that we saw in it are men of a great stature. There's nothing to be desired there. We don't want to mess with the people that live there. It's not even, the land isn't even worth it. Liars. Liars. 33, and we saw the giants, more giants, the sons of Anak, which come of the giants, and we were in, a, we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, and so we were in their sight. That may have been so, but it wouldn't have mattered. The Lord was with them. They could have taken it, but they feared man. They feared man greatly. Verse 1 of chapter 14, And all the congregation lifted up their voice and cried, and the people wept that night. They were very concerned about these men. They were very anxious. They were trembling, quaking for these men that they were, th were going to have to fight. And all the children of Israel murmured against Moses and Aaron. Notice, if, if you remember all the times that the children of Israel murmur against Moses and Aaron, it is always for what God had done. It is, they, they, they murmur against his servants. They murmur against the messengers. Moses and Aaron didn't do anything but follow what God had said. That's all that they had done. They were murmuring against God by murmuring against his servants, his faithful servants. So they were, in essence, murmuring against God. And the whole congregation said unto them, Would God that we had died in the land of Egypt, or would God we had died in the wilderness? Oh, we, it would have been better for us to perish in Egypt or in the wilderness. For this was shortly after they had been, they had been fed by, by manna. God had, been, had started giving them manna six days a week. They wished that they would have died in Egypt. Although while they were in Egypt, they did nothing but pray to God that he would free them from bondage. Silly, silly people, silly people. And wherefore hath the Lord brought us unto this land to fall by the sword? He's delivered us out of these things so that we're going to die by the hands of these men. 
We've made it out of Egypt. We've made it through the wilderness. God has fed us and watered us like he has. And now we're just going to die by the hands of these men. That our wives and our children should be a prey. Were it not better for us to return to Egypt? And they said one to another, let us make a captain and let us return to Egypt. How foolish. How foolish. They had the Lord God with them, feeding them, watering them, making sure that they were safe. Yet they wanted to return to Egypt. So much so that they even made a plan that they were going to raise a captain and he was going to lead them back. Verse 5, Then Moses and Aaron fell on their faces before all the assembly of the congregation of the children of Israel, and Joshua the son of Nun, and Caleb the son of uh, Jephunneh. Those were the only two spies that brought back a good report. Those were the only two spies. Joshua there is the same Joshua uh, that the book of Joshua is based on. Which were of them that searched the land, rent their clothes. They spake unto all the company of the children of Israel, saying, The land which we pass through to search it is an exceeding good land. Don't believe that evil report. Don't believe that, 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 that uh, uh, bad report of the land. They're lying. They, uh, they did not want to fight these men. If the Lord delight in us, then he will bring us into this land and give it us a land which floweth with milk and honey. They knew that the Lord would give it. They knew that the Lord had promised that he would give it. Only rebel not ye against the Lord, neither fear ye the people of the land. Because they knew, Joseph, or, or excuse me, Joshua and Caleb knew that they feared the people of the land. They knew that they feared man more than they feared God. For they are bread for us. Their defense is departed from them, and the Lord is with us. Fear them not. The Lord God is with his people. And if he be for us, who can be against us? But all the congregation bade stone them with stones, and the glory of the Lord appeared in the tabernacle of the congregation before all the children of Israel. They, they, dis, they so did not want to hear the truth, they even sought to stone them with stones. So the Lord appeared to stop that from happening. The Lord appeared, and he is not happy. He is not happy with their fear of man. Verse 11, And the Lord said unto Moses, How long will this people provoke me, and how long will it be ere they believe me for all the signs which I have showed among them? How many signs had he shown among them? He delivered them, the same people that are doing this, he delivered across the Red Sea. The same people, he split the water in two as it was a wall on either side, and they walked across on dry land. The same people, he had the water closed on the Egyptians so that they saw, and saw those Egyptians never again. Even their horses, all, all of these things, and he watered them and fed them like he did. Yet, they did not trust in him. They feared man. They feared man, and it brought, it brought a great snare. A great entrapment. This word snare is also, also translated gin or trap. It is a tight, constricting place, a place you do not want to be. The fear of man is what it brings that about. We come to the, to the uh, uh, further in this, in this same chapter. <clears throat> Verse 22. Because all those men which have seen my glory and my miracles, which I did in Egypt and in the wilderness... And have tempted me now these ten times, and have not hearkened to my voice. Here is what the fear of man is going to bring them. Surely they shall not see the land which I swear unto their fathers, neither shall any of them that provoked me to see it. But my servant Caleb, because he had another spirit with him, and hath followed me fully, him will I bring into the land, whereunto he went, and his seed shall possess it. Now the Amalekites and the Canaanites dwell in the valley. Tomorrow turn you and get you into the wilderness by the way of the Red Sea. He says, You're not, uh, none of you are going to, to enter that land except for my servant Caleb. And you read further on, it would, uh, 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 Joshua would as well. Not even Moses and Aaron would enter the land. Only those two that were of that age and everybody that was under the age of 20. We continue reading in verse, verse 40. Or, excuse me, pick, pick up at verse 30, uh, 30. Doubtless ye shall not come into the land concerning which I swear to make you dwell therein, save Caleb the son of Jephunneh and Joshua the son of Nun. 
but your little ones, which ye, ye said should be a prey, them will I bring in, and they shall know the land which ye have despised. But as for you, your carcasses, they shall fall in this wilderness, and your children shall wander in the wilderness forty years, and bear your whoredoms until your carcasses be wasted in the wilderness. After the number of days in which ye search the land, even forty days, remember they were in the land, searching the land for forty days, each day for a year shall ye bear your iniquities, even forty years, and ye shall know my breach of promise. They breached his promise. He told them to go. And they, they thought, oh, we're, we're smarter than the Lord. We know our abilities better than the Lord God. No, you don't. Again, the Lord said, this is the great snare that you're going to be in because you fear man more than you fear me. Come to verse 40. They, they decided, oh, now that the Lord said we could take it, but he said don't, now we're going to again go against his word because we're going to show the Lord that we believe him. We're going to clench our fists and clench our jaw and, and clamp down on this and we're going to show him that we trust him. That's not how trusting the Lord works. You don't go against what he says to show him that you trust him. Verse, verse 40, they rose up early in the morning and got them up to the top of the mountain saying, Lo, we be here and will go up to the place which the Lord hath promised. He promised it, but not to them. Not to them. He promised it to their children. For we have sinned. And Moses said, Wherefore now do you transgress the commandment of, of the Lord? But it shall not prosper. You're transgressing and it's not going to go well with you. Is what, he's, is what he's telling them. Go not up, for the Lord is not among you, and ye be not smitten before your, that ye be not smitten before your enemies. Moses knew that the Lord God told them no, and they were, dis, they were being disobedient, that they were going to be smitten before their enemies. For the Amalekites and the Canaanites are there before you. Ye shall fall by the sword, because ye are turned away from the Lord. Therefore, the Lord will not be with you, but they presumed to go up unto the hilltop. Nevertheless, the ark of the covenant of the Lord and Moses departed not out of the camp. They stayed. The other foolish people went. Then the Amalekites came down on the Canaanites which dwelt in the land and smote them and discomfited them even, uh, them even unto Hormah. They were destroyed. Absolutely demolished because the Lord was not with them. They feared man more than they feared God, and it brought them a great snare. We, we come next to the New Testament. There are examples of this all over the place. Come to John chapter 12. As you're, as you're coming there, another, another example. You remember Ahab. You remember Ahab and, and how he had all those prophets come to him in Jehoshaphat, and he desired a good prophecy concerning his battle. And the one prophet of God comes before him and says, don't do it. The Lord's not with you. You're going to die. And he decides, I'm not going to fear God. In fact, I'm going to disguise myself. I'm going to try and fool God. God says, I'm going to die. I'm going to make myself look like a common person. But Jehoshaphat, you, you go ahead in your kingly attire. They'll think you're me and they'll come after you. The Lord delivered Jehoshaphat out of that. He did not deliver Ahab. That's right. John chapter 12 and verse 42. Nevertheless, we'll get verse 41. These things said Isaiah when he saw his glory and spake of him. That's referring back to Isaiah chapter 6. Jesus had just, had just, uh, 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 had recited for, or, or uh, cited Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah said those things when he saw Jesus, when he saw Jesus and his glory. Nevertheless, among the chief rulers also many believed on him. Many of the chief rulers believed on Jesus is what it says. But look at who they fear. But because of the Pharisees, because of men, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue. That would bring a great, a, a great snare to you, to, to the child of God. If, if this is truly a child of God, I can't imagine the conviction that would come under them. We, we have a, a, a hymn writer, I can't remember his name. 
he fell into sin. And he was convicted of the Holy Spirit of that sin. And it is, it is a great hymn. It is a great hymn. Uh, it might be Come Thou Fount. I can't remember uh, uh, the gentleman that wrote it. Robert Robinson. Yes, Robert Robinson. The conviction that fell on that man. The conviction that falls on the child of God when, when, they, won't, when they won't confess their sin, when they won't confess the Lord Jesus. It's debilitating. It is debilitating. I cannot imagine what if these were chil if these were children of God, what they were going through on the inside. Here's the reason why they didn't do it. For they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. That is a great snare. Loving the praise of men more than the praise of God is not a good place to be. It brings the same the same thing that the Israelites went through. It brings the same results. The foolish, the, nat the natural man is foolish. He, he desires to do the same thing over and over and over again, expecting a different result. That's the definition of insanity. That is what the natural man does. He does not desire, he, he does not de Our dear, beloved Apostle Peter fall into the same snare. Uh, uh, Matthew chapter 26 and verse 69 is where we will begin. Now Peter, this is the Lord Jesus, is being, is being tried. Now Peter sat without. He sat outside in the palace, and a damsel came unto him, saying, Thou also wast with Jesus of Galilee. She, rec she recognizes that he was also with him. Verse 70, But he denied before them all, saying, I know not what thou sayest. I don't know him. I was never with him. I'm just here witnessing like all the rest of you. I'm just a common folk. I'm just like any, any of the rest of you. I don't know who he is. Remember before this, he told the Lord Jesus, I'll never deny you. I'm ready to die with you. He said that under his own power. The Lord Jesus knew exactly what was about to happen. He told him before, before the rooster crows twice, you'll deny me three times. Here's the first time. 71, and when he gone out into the porch, another maid saw him and said unto them that were, that were there, this fellow also was also with Jesus of Nazareth. This, this, this guy was with him. We need to get him down there also. We need to, he needs to be standing next to the Lord Jesus. We need to try him also. But that is not what Peter desired. And again, he denied with an oath. I do not know the man. I swear I don't know the man. He swore. He, he gave an oath that he didn't know the man. He denied again. This, this time, it, it would have been, he would have understood exactly. The first time, maybe it just blurted out of his mouth and he wasn't thinking about what he said. The second time, that's, that's deliberate. He, had thought, he thought about what he did. And he knew exactly what he was doing. But he feared man. He feared man. He was concerned about his own life. He knew what was going to happen to the Lord Jesus Christ. He knew that he, was about to, that he was about to be killed. And he didn't want to have the same fate. He did not want to have that same fate with the Lord Jesus at this very time. 73. And after a while came unto him they that stood by and said to Peter, Surely thou art also one of them, for thy speech bereath thee. The way you talk. We in America, uh, you, you, you know a northern accent versus a southern accent versus a midwestern accent versus somebody who, who uh, lives on the, on the east or west coast. We all talk a little bit different. We all speak a little bit differently. Same way in their day. They were all from Galilee. They spoke a little bit different. Peter was, was no different. They could tell that he was from Galilee by the way he spoke. You can tell that somebody's from Boston by the way they speak. Can you not? Same thing. Same thing. His speech betray, it berayeth. It gives evidence. It makes it certain is, is how, how it is elsewhere translated. It gives evidence that you're lying. Then began he to curse and to swear. He wanted, he wanted to make absolutely sure. He wanted to build up some anger about it. I absolutely don't know him. I absolutely don't know him, saying, I know not the man, and immediately the cock or the rooster 
crew. Then, and Peter remembered the word of Jesus, which said unto him, Before the cock crow, and in, and in uh, um, one of the other gospels, it's before it crow twice, before it crew twice, thou shalt deny me thrice or three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. The conviction that comes over the child of God for something. On, and, and Peter was a born again child of God at this point. Blessed are his ears for they hear, the Lord Jesus said. Blessed are all of the disciples' ears for they, heard, they could hear. We are given hearing ears and obedient hearts in the new birth. They had been born again also. Peter, the conviction that he, went, that he came under. We know that he was restored by the Lord Jesus Christ according to the, the end of John's gospel. And the Lord Jesus did tell him, the next time you won't deny me because he, gave, he told him what type of death he would die. We know that, that Peter was restored, but this is what happens when we fear men more than we fear God, and that is something that, that we ought not to fall into. Peter, Peter was come to Antioch. I, Paul, withstood him to the face because he was to be blamed. For before that certain came from James... So, so Peter was to be blamed for this. Uh, certain men came from James. Certain Jews came from the church in Jerusalem. He did eat with the Gentiles. Peter ate with the Gentiles. But when they were come, when those Jews from Jerusalem came, he withdrew, separated himself, fearing them which were of the circumcision. He started to, I'm a Jew, you're a Gentile. We're going we're gonna to go back and separate again just like we were under, under the old covenant law. We're not, he was not practicing the unity that Jew and Gentile have in the Lord Jesus Christ. There is not Jew or Greek or Gentile or barbarian or Scythian, nor male nor female, nor bond nor free in the Lord Jesus Christ. We recognize those things in the flesh, but in the Lord Jesus Christ, there are none of those things. We are one in the Lord Jesus Christ, and he was not practicing that. The other Jews dissembled likewise with him, insomuch that Barnabas also was carried away with the dissimulation. Peter, again, feared to be blamed. He went along with this. The beloved apostle Peter, again, does something so foolish. We can all do so foolish also. But, but Peter here, just as an example unto us, what, uh, what not to do, what fearing man looks like that we may see in our lives that the, 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 the times that we may, our natural man wants to fear man. Our natural man does not want to fear God. He wants to fear man. The hirelings today that have closed their churches due, due to COVID, the, they're hirelings. They're not, they're not pastors. They're not under shepherds. If they're still closed, it's not a church. They fear man more than they fear God. God says to meet on his day. But they, they fear man more than they fear God. Now, with the time remaining, I would like for us to examine the rest of this verse. Because we're given a negative, what not to do. What not to do here in Proverbs chapter 29 and verse 25, the fear of man bringeth a snare. That is an, an exhortation to not do that. But here is the contrast. What we should do, whoso putteth his trust in the Lord shall be safe. Amen. Trust. This, this correlates with our, with our New Testament belief or uh, the act of, of faith. The faith that we spoke of this morning, the object of that faith is who is to be trusted, the one to be believed. Whoso putteth his trust in the Lord shall be safe. It is also trans translated most often trust, but also confidence, secure. And if you come back to Proverbs chapter 28 and verse 1, you'll see that it's translated bold. The wicked flee when no man pursueth, but the righteous are bold as a lion. Why are they bold? Because of the Lord God that stands behind them. He makes them bold. It is he who does it, not, not we ourselves, but bold or, and hope, expectation. 
is how it is also rendered. And this word safe, the one who puts their trust in the Lord shall be safe. Also translated high most often. High, exalted, or defended. Which makes perfect sense. We are in a battle. Those are, those are battle terms. In a battle, you want the high ground. Easier to defend yourself. You, you waste less, in, less energy looking up and fighting upward, running up a hill, rather than running down a hill or looking down or, or any, of those, any of those things. It's a ba- these are, this is a battle term. You want the high ground. We are in a battle. Not a, not a carnal battle, not a physical battle, a spiritual battle. Our weapons are not carnal, but they're mighty through God to the bringing down of strongholds. We are in a war. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 12 tell, speaks of this very thing. If I can get there. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. We're not in a physical war but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. And there is spiritual wickedness in high places. You don't have to look hard, and you see it all over the place. We are in a war, but he that puts his trust in the Lord will be safe. He'll be defended, because it is the Lord who defends them. It is the Lord who, who puts them on high. It is the Lord who makes them safe. The, some, this, this, this isn't just taught here. Even the Lord Jesus taught that in his earthly ministry. In Matthew 10, 28 and Luke 12, 5, he said, Don't fear him that can kill the body, but afterwards can do nothing. Fear him that after he kills the body, and yes, God has power and the ability and the, and the right to kill the body, but afterward has the right to, to kill, to destroy the soul in hell. He has the right and the power and the ability to do that. We should fear him, not him that can just kill the body, but afterwards can do no more. Him that can just kill the body, but afterwards can do no more. Joseph, at this point, they were very fearful of Joseph. They were very concerned after their father had died. That now, Joseph, now that our father's died, now that our father is dead, he's going to take his vengeance on us for what we did to him. All of his brothers sold him into slavery, and he went through great perils. But you know what? He never hated them. He could have. The world would have said he he deserved to hate them. But he knew that that was not God's purpose. He put his trust in the Lord. The Lord guided him through all of this. They desired to do evil against him. What they did was horrible. Verse 20 of chapter 50. But as for you, ye thought evil against me. They wanted to do, they wanted to hurt him. They wanted to do wicked things to him because they did not, they hated him. But God meant it unto good. The same act, the, the, God's plan the whole time was for that to happen, to bring to pass as it is this day to save much people alive. Joseph was put as as the as the father to uh, as a father to Pharaoh, Lord over all his house, in charge of all uh, all of his uh, uh, kingdom, second in command. The Lord exalted him to that point to the saving of many lives alive that day. The very same thing, the Lord meant it unto good. He trusted the Lord. He knew exactly why he was in the position that he was. He trusted the Lord, not fearing man at that, at that point in time, though his brothers were very fearful of him because at any point Joseph could have said, guards, take him out. He had, he had all, all, the, all the weaponry, all the people at his disposal. They were very concerned. They weren't trusting the Lord in what, in what was going on, but Joseph trusted the Lord through all of that. Moses' mother in the next in the, or excuse me, the, uh, the midwives in Exodus chapter 1. You see at the very end of Exodus chapter 1, Pharaoh, a new Pharaoh, desired that all the men, all the, 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 man, the, the man children, the, ba- the male babies of the Israelites be killed, that they be tossed into, into the river Nile and that they, that they perish. But the midwives 
would not have that. 17 of Exodus chapter 1, but the midwives feared God. Notice they didn't, it doesn't say that they feared Pharaoh. They feared God. They didn't follow what he stated, what he commanded, what he dictated. He was a tyrant. And resistance to tyranny is obedience to God in this sake. And did not, as the king of Egypt commanded them, but saved the men children alive. They didn't follow what he said because they were obeying God and not man. And therefore, verse 20, therefore God dealt well with them. He gave them houses. He blessed them greatly. They trusted in the Lord, and the Lord made them safe. And we, you continue on into the next chapter. You see Moses' mother. Moses' mother, after she could not hide Moses any longer, put him, made a, made a little ark for him, a little boat, put the baby down in it, and put him in the River Nile. She, she couldn't hide him anymore, so she followed both as best she could, trusting God that he would take care of the baby. And, and he did. He delivered that baby in a roundabout way back to her to take care of until he was weaned. Until he was three years old, then he became Pharaoh's grandson. And he learned, he, he learned many things. I, I imagine he went to school, learned many things. But when the time came, he cast off the riches of Egypt and uh, 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 suffered with God's people, forsaking sin for a season. He, de he desired to be with God's people. But M M Moses' mother was rewarded. She was, her, her hopes were made safe. Her hopes were secured by putting her trust in the Lord God. David fleed from Absalom. He, he knew that the Lord God would deliver him. You come to Psalm 3. Psalm 3 is a psalm of David when he fled from Absalom, his son. He fled from Absalom because Absalom had, had betrayed him, had come uh, against him, his son. His son came against him. So he, so he flees, but he knows that the Lord is going to deliver him. He puts his trust in the Lord. Lord, how are they increased that trouble me? Many are they that rise up against me. Many there be which say of my soul, there is no help for him in God. And then he gives us an admonition to think on that. Think deeply, ponder that. But thou, O Lord, art a shield for me, my glory, and the lifter up of mine head. I cried unto the Lord with my voice, and he heard me out of his holy hill. He's in great distress. But yet he knows the Lord has heard him. So he tells us again, ponder, think deeply on that. I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people that have set themselves against me round about. Arise, O Lord, save or deliver me, O my God, for thou hast smitten all mine enemies upon the cheekbone. Thou hast broken the teeth of the ungodly. Salvation belongeth unto the Lord. Thy blessing is upon thy people. And again, think deeply upon that. God's blessing was, is upon his people. He, just as before, did not fear man. He put his trust in the Lord. The Lord delivered him. The Lord made him safe. The Lord set him on high, saved him, secured him. And we know, we know the story that David would be returned to his throne and Absalom would be killed against David's wishes. David desired him to be uh, saved alive. But that, that, uh, that was the Lord's plan. Elijah, 1 Kings 17, another, another example. F feel free to go there if you would like. But Elijah, when he was preaching against, uh, uh, against Israel, against all their abominations, against all their idolatries, against everything that they were doing, and that famine and drought were coming, the Lord told him, Okay, go, go to the brook and I'll feed you by raven. He didn't say, Lord, that doesn't make any sense. He didn't question. He did exactly what God told him. The Lord, may, the Lord he put his trust in the Lord. He trusted. He took the Lord at his word. That's right. There's nothing, uh, we don't need to question what the Lord says. If he says he's going to do something, he's going to do it. Elijah was a, was a perfect example of that. The Lord said, go, go by the brook. I'll have ravens feed you morning and evening. And he went by the brook and ravens, uh, he, he drank from the brook and the 
He is the one who Elijah put his trust in, and the Lord God made him safe. Isaiah, another, another example. Imagine having to preach a message that he was given. Go tell, go tell your kindred, your brethren, those you love, that it's too late. Isaiah 6 and verse 8, that, that, is what Isaiah, that is what he was given to do. But he did it faithfully. He did what the Lord God bid him to do. The Lord God, at the end of his book, you see that. Come to Acts. Come to Acts chapter, chapter 7. The end of Acts chapter 7, we see Stephen. We see Stephen being stoned. But he's, he's not recanting. He's not, he's not concerned about what's happening. He has already laid into the crowd, describing to them how the Lord Jesus is who the Lord Jesus is. Verse 57, Then they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord. That's how the wicked will always react to the truth. They will always cry out with a loud voice and stop their ears. We don't want to hear. We don't want to hear is what the wicked desire. They don't like the truth. And cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at, the, at a young man's feet whose name was Saul. We know, we know him as the Apostle Paul. You can continue reading about, uh, about what happens to this young man, Saul. And they stoned Stephen, call, who was calling upon God, saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. He didn't say, oh guys, I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't mean to offend you. He didn't say, I didn't mean anything I just said. Oh, he knew what, exactly what was about to happen, and yet was more bold in what, in what he was preaching, was more bold in his message, all because the Lord God, he knew exactly what was, what was about to happen. He, wasn't, he was delivered unto life everlasting. Far greater is it for us to depart and be with Christ. Than to be, than to continue on in this world, and it was not the Lord God, the Lord God's purpose for him to continue any longer. Verse sixty, and he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, "Lay not this sin to their charge." And when he said this, he fell asleep, or he died. The Lord God did make him safe. He set him on high, literally. Set him on high with him. The Lord Jesus was standing next uh, next to the throne, ready to receive him ready to receive him into his presence. You continue on in, in Acts chapter 16. You see Paul in great bondage. He's, already, he's, he's been whipped many times, and he's in the, in the center of the prison. But what are they doing? They're not weeping and moaning and mourning over being in prison. They're praying and singing praises to God. The, the Philippian jailer was saved that night. All, all uh, the Lord had a purpose in putting them in that place. The Lord desired for them to be there. They didn't have a, a bad attitude about it. Lord, why would you want me here? There's no reason for me to be here. The Lord had a purpose for them being there. And that purpose was that one of his elect and, and his family. His, uh, he had given elect to that elect uh, Philippian jailer that they would come to know the gospel, that they would come to know what the Lord Jesus had, had done for them. I have no doubt that that Philippian jailer was part of the church at Philippi. He came to know a great truth that, I, that, that blessed his soul greatly. But I would like to end. We can't, we can't talk about not fearing man and putting our trust in the Lord without describing the Lord Jesus, without talking. He didn't have anything to his name while he was on this earth though he was king of all though he was lord of all he had nothing in this world there's no in, in Isaiah 53 there's no beauty there's no uh, majesty about him that we ought to have desired him that was the lord jesus he had no place to lay his head but he you know what he wasn't concerned he wasn't concerned about where he was going to eat next because he knew that his father would provide. He trusted his father in everything, in every aspect of his life. He trusted his father. You see that in Matthew 8:20 and Luke 9:58. Come come to the gospel according to Luke chapter 23. I'd like I'd like for us to see 
how our Lord handled what he was about to go through. 23, excuse me, 22, 22 and 41. And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's cast and knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was, as it were, great drops of blood falling down to the ground. The Lord Jesus was uh, th this cup, our sin that he was going, to, was going to drink, that was going to be imputed to him. He was, he, if, if it was at all possible, if there was any other way that we could be saved, he says, Father, let it be. But if there is not, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Even in his great agony, I can't imagine what it would be like to sweat drops of blood. That's a, an actual medical condition, and I'm sure it would be excruciating. But he looks to his father. Nevertheless, I don't, I don't care what, what has to be done for, us to, for, for me to save the people that thou gavest me. Your will, let it be done. Always look at Mark 15, 3, he was silent. And that was not because he was scared. He was fulfilling scripture. Isaiah 53, 7 says, he's, says, he, uh, says he is silent, says that he is uh, like a sheep before its shearers. Isaiah 53, 7, he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. The Lord Jesus wasn't scared of, of man or everything. Even on the cross, the excruciating pain he was going through with those nails going through his wrists and through his heels, he then says, Father, into thy hands commend my eye, my, my, eye, my spirit. Uh, he always, always looking to his Father. May we walk in that perfect example, desire to follow that perfect example that the Lord Jesus gave us by not walking as we used to, because we used to walk just as, just as Gentiles, just as the heathen. We used to walk just like them. We, we had our conversation, our conduct in times past, just like them. We were leaning on man, looking to man for what he can do, looking to man as our savior and not the Lord God, may we not tremble before man as we once did, but instead, by following the word of God, by the power and grace that works in us, by his power, it's not, it's not something that we muster up, but it is something that he works in us. We can avoid the snares and the entrapments of this world. Man promises many things, but he cannot accomplish all that he desires, but the counsel of the Lord, the desires of his heart, stand to all generations. May we, by his grace, learn to ever walk trusting him, not fearing man. For fearing man brings great trouble, but fearing God, fearing God causes us to depart from evil. And he that trusts in the Lord or believeth in the Lord, believeth on the Lord, shall never be ashamed. Let us bow in prayer this evening. Our Father and our God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for how it instructs us in this life. We, we see how we have walked in times past. May you open our eyes to that and cause us to walk in a way that is well-pleasing in your sight. It is only by your power and by your grace that these things can be done. And may you do them for your glory and for your honor, for our edification. May we learn to look to you in all of our ways, acknowledging you and not fearing man, not trembling, not quaking before man, but having a reverential fear of our Lord. For your glory and honor, I pray and ask these things in Jesus' name.